1 Samuel chapter 3. Do you have it? Say amen. 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 Verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I have called not. Lie down again, and he went and laid down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. The Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child after the third time. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant yes. here. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant here. Amen. Amen. Well, his verse this morning is taken from the same chapter, verse 9. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Dear Lord, we love you, Lord, and appreciate you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together and worship you. We pray, Lord, as your word goes forth, such our hearts and minds receive from you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're starting our series of lessons on transformational relationships. And the first key to transformation is the grand skill of listening. Amen. When we learn to listen to the voice of authority, it is much easier to hear the voice of God. That's right. Peniah, 
Hannah's yearly visit to the house of the Lord was a time for weeping and fasting rather than a celebration of the gift of life. Wrestling with the bitterness of her barrenness rather than tasting the food and drink of the feast, Hannah prayed for her son, promising that the boy would serve the Lord all the days of his life. Even the act of pouring out her soul to the Lord, she faced Eli's rebuke when he mistook her desperate prayer for drunkenness. Now remember, I read for scripture where it said, Eli, there was no open vision. The man of God, Eli, was missing a connection with God. Now we all know the state of his family, his sons, whom he allowed to continue to serve in the temple, even though they were using the temple and the game for their own good. But Eli, being the man of God, did not, or he lost sight of what his role or God's plan for him was. Amen. Amen. So it is understandable that when you hear the voice of Hannah crying out, someone who is unable to hear God and see what God wants to do, could mistake the desperate plea of a barren mother. Maybe if Eli would have took the lead or followed Hannah's example and cried out for someone that could take over because it wasn't going to be his sons to, to take over the work of the Lord. Maybe Eli would then maybe redeemed some of his dignity. Eli truly understood her plight. He felt compassion for her and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. The Lord took note of Hannah and responded to her request, and he gave her a son of promise. She honored her vow. She dedicated her son's family to the service of the Lord. Now the Lord had listened to Hannah. It was time for Samuel to hear the voice of the Lord at a time when prophecy was rare. It's so amazing when you look at the Bible and you read about even in the Old Testament and you come across these situations and, and you can put in today and say, you know what? This sounds like today. Put in, put in the context what you hear. See, a lot of times people believe that the Old Testament is exactly that old. We're under the New Covenant. So what is the old? The old is the build-up to the new. The new is the Old Testament in action. Everything that, that was prophesied in the Old Testament, everything that was that was expected to happen and prophesied about happened in the New Testament. It was a buildup from one to the other. It was not a, a okay, the old done, now we got a new. Now we got a new teaching. Now we got a new learning. Now we got a new understanding. No. This was the, the New Testament learning and understanding and the New Testament teaching was what God was trying to get his people to understand in the old. Yes. Right. And so when we look at things in the Bible, we have to understand that, you know what, they are relevant for today. No matter where you find it. Yes. Whether it be an Old Testament or a New Testament. Yes. It is relevant for today. Yes. Yes. Right. And a lot of times we have a problem with churches today that the leadership lack vision. Yeah. Then your eyes are dim. And then, then all of a sudden it comes the agenda they're pushing is their own 
not God's. I'm crazy enough to believe that God has a bigger plan than me. Amen. I'm not the, the, the end all to God's plan. I'm a part of it, but not the end all. God's plan is bigger than me. God's plan is bigger than all of us. Yes. There's not one that plays a more important role than another. Amen. We all do the same thing. We all work for the same goal. And we all strive for the same purpose. Amen. Amen. Eli needed vision Sight. He said his eyes were waxing dim. Couldn't see God's working. Couldn't recognize it when it happened. He couldn't see Samuel being put in his care. Was God's plan. Right. right. He couldn't see those things. And God sent him someone that wasn't yet tainted by the ugliness of the world. Who had a childlike attitude. Who had a childlike faith. Who just did what he was told to do. Nowhere in it ever in green where he asked why. As a parent. You ask your child to do something, you better be prepared with an answer before you tell them. Because you know no matter what they're gonna ask why. Right. They want to know why. <laughs> and then the because I told you so. For some reason, just isn't a good enough reason. It's not. But nowhere did I ever read where Samuel asked Eli, why? When he said, when you hear God, when you hear that voice again, just say, here am I. Thy servant, thy servant, hear. Why, Eli? Just do it. I didn't do that. Okay, so we went back to bed when that happened. Did you notice it read that time? The fourth time, the, vo the voice was actually followed by a vision. Right. Because he wasn't going to let Samuel walk out of the room again. Right. <clears throat> Prophecy was rare. Vision was rare. And Eli was given an opportunity while yet still high priest, prophet, to have it back once again in Samuel. Samuel 3 and 1, 1 Samuel 3 and 1 says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Before Samuel could learn to hear the voice of the Lord and become a great prophet, he had to follow the instructions of Eli. You know, sometimes, as I said, the skill that some of us or all of us maybe at times have trouble with is listening. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, because we always want to know inside why. Right. I mean, even with my approach to studying the Word of God, when I, when I read something, I'll ask God, why this? You know? Thankfully, He has patience enough to explain to me. Just take it for what it is. It's my Word. He doesn't do that with me. 
he'll explain why. And we got to understand something. The Bible is written two different ways. There is a physical application to it, and there is a spiritual application to Amen. it. Every scripture has a spiritual application behind it somewhere. And sometimes it is impossible to envision the spiritual thinking of God. Sometimes it is open as the word of the Lord is precious in those days. There was no open vision. There's no question there as far as what the spiritual application is of that. Do you realize you can have a love and an honor for the Bible and still have no vision? Think about that for a minute. Sometimes we have people that can quote the Bible forwards and backwards. You give them a scripture, they can tell you what it is. Right. And they can hold it precious to them and still miss the vision of the word. Physically, David did not have the skill or the ability to do what he did. So then you obviously would have to come to the conclusion that there is a spiritual implication behind that historical event. Yeah. Right? Amen. Because David couldn't do it in his own self. He had to have spiritual help. He had to have heavenly help. Amen. 
He had to have godly help. And who did that come from? It came from the one that he exalted every day. Yes. Came from the one he worshipped and praised every day. And when the Bible doesn't say that God told David to go down there and do that. It doesn't say that. But somewhere within the heart of David, there was a decision made. And so you ask yourself, okay, spiritual applications. So therefore, if we settle on the written word as it's written, and not look to the deeper, and I've said this many times, we work on the physical. Mm -hmm. But the true message of the Bible isn't what you physically read. It's in the spiritual application of the word of God. And what we have a problem with is applying or even digging out the spiritual application. So therefore, I've made a, told you a long story to say that's why sometimes when I'm studying the Word of God, I ask Him why. Because there is not one word on that Bible in the Bible that is wasted. So if He took time to write particular words. You have to say, okay, why that particular word? Right. Going back to the story of David, there's so many of those. Like, why did he grab? Why did the Bible say he grabbed five smooth stones? Right. Okay, what's the, you know, physically we're thinking, okay, five smooth stones. I have a deer rifle. It has three four shots in it. It just seems likely that you would grab enough stones and can't reload. The Bible was specific when it said five stones. So there has to be something there. And what happens is when there's a lack of vision, that precious word of God loses its power. Because all we can see is the written words. So that's where the ability to listen. Because the word of God is God breathed. It is alive. It's not a dead, it's it's not like any other book that just yeah, yeah. Amen. it's one dimensional. It's words on a piece of paper. The Bible is three-dimensional. That's right. Yeah, Actually, it's two-dimensional. It covers this world and the next. That's right. yeah. Amen. But what happens is, when you don't have the vision, you miss the application part of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So if the Bible is a living, breathing Word of God, the Bible is a And, and to discredit or discount the word of God and say, oh, that, that, that's not for today. Or, and, and I know people have done that. I know people have said that. I know, you know, we're in a new dispensation. A new dispensation. Where did it come from? Just because there's a word New Testament and Old Testament on it? We struggle with the same things today as they did then. Right. Believe it or not, before Samuel could learn to hear the voice of the Lord and become a great prophet, he had to follow the instructions of Eli. At first, Samuel must have felt confused at having this new authority figure in his life, although his mother had probably told him the story of her vow many times. He now had to fulfill the commitment she had made. <coughs> Excuse me. Samuel's miraculous birth made him unique, but his ability to tune into the divine frequency would 
further set him apart from others. At this time, the word of the Lord proved to be a rare and precious commodity. Few people saw the visions or heard from God, but as Eli's eyes began to dim spiritually and physically, God gave Samuel spiritual insight into his plan. So the prophet Eli lacked vision and ability to see spiritually. <clears throat> Children of Israel, as, as tumultuous as their, as their existence was in the Old Testament, they needed a voice of reason. They needed the voice of the prophet. They needed someone to guide them Amen. step by step. And that pressure fell on the shoulders of someone who lacked vision, And the ability to see. So God, with his infinite desire to see his children of Israel move into a different way of thinking. And actually, we're going to back that up. Do we understand? The New Testament is not a new way of thinking. New Testament's not new. I said earlier, it's the Old Testament in action. Because Jesus says, I'm not here to destroy the law, I'm the fulfillment of the law. So what he's saying is, the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The plan of salvation that we that we hold so dear, that came to us through Acts and the voice of Peter and Jesus, that, that, that plan was all the way back in Genesis. When Abraham told Isaac, God would provide for himself a sacrifice. That's right, man. God's relationship with man and how God wanted to relate with man goes all the way back to Genesis. Because when God breathes a breath of life into somebody, He's breathing life into their soul. Not into their physical body. So what does that mean? God is not so concerned about the physicality of this life. That's right. His concern lies with the soul and the spirit of this life. Amen. Because the Bible says the Lord God is a spirit. And now let's worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. service did not end when he came of age. Even though Samuel might have reasoned, he could break a vow he did not make. He chose to honor his mother and his God. Just as the Lord opened his mother's womb so she could conceive, God opened Samuel's ears so he could hear the word of the Lord and be more than just another child or adult serving in the tabernacle. Samuel would be a prophet who heard, obeyed, and spoke the word of God. One thing we've got to understand, okay, and we might not truly think because, but you would have to understand the history, and you would have to understand the way things were at that time. Samuel was not probably the only child there. Besides Eli's own son, it was not uncommon for the children to be put into the service of the Lord. But Samuel was the only one that God summoned. Who knows? 
Maybe God summoned other children. And because of Eli's inability to recognize what was going on, they missed out on the call of God. Now that's just a speculation. That's just something to think about. But it only seems to stand the reason. It only stands the reason. Samuel was not the only child. Right? He was the only one who heard the voice of God and responded to the voice of God. I would have to think that maybe, just maybe, he fell inside. Samuel enjoyed his work there. We know young people and kids. We know them so well when it comes to doing something they don't enjoy. They don't listen. I have a whole list of stuff my girls don't like to do. And anytime you ask them, they, they, all of a sudden their, their selective hearing switches go on and they don't want to hear it. Right? It happens. So Samuel heard the voice of God. Samuel responded. And we all know Samuel became the one who anointed David king. And we all know what line of David became bloodline of Jesus. Samuel, that boy, in a time when the word of God was precious, brought about Jesus Christ. Redemption for all. Because he was able to listen and hear the voice of God and respond. Now my point is, sometimes, like I said, we respond better if the voice is audible. But the Word of God is a living, breathing entity. It speaks. Amen. And when we don't read it or we don't study it, it can't speak to us. And when we rest on the physical portion of the Word of God and what the words that are written on the page, and we don't want to go any deeper, God can't speak to us right. through right. the written Word. Right. God speaks to us through the spiritual portion of the Word. And so therefore, when you read the Word of God, don't look at the words on the page and say, okay, Get inquisitive. Why five smooth stones? Why did he take the time to point that out? And the Word of God isn't so much trying to understand the mentality of the characters in the historical events. It is more trying to reveal to you God. Amen. As great of a character, as great as a person David was, who had his faults, who made mistakes, who did things wrong, as great as he was, the Word of God is still all about God. It's not about David. It's not about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not about all of that stuff. It's about God. Amen. The children of Israel found themselves wandering in the wilderness. Why? Because they thought it would be just fun to walk around in the woods for 40 days, for 40 years? Because they wouldn't Listen to God. He told them, go, possess your promised land. I have already given it to you. It's yours. All you need to do is go possess it. And they chose to wander in the wilderness. Right. Because they got so fixated on the giants and the walled cities.
They were so fixated on the physicality of their world that they missed what God was trying to do. Yeah. Yes. The Bible isn't about David. It's not about Daniel. It's not about Paul. It's not about the disciples. It's not about Ruth. It's not about Esther. It's not about all those. It's not about all those characters. All those historical, real life people. It's about God. And say, okay, what does the story of David and Goliath tell me about God? What does the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace tell me about God? What does Abraham taking Isaac up to a mountain to sacrifice him on an altar tell me about God? And that is where God speaks. So the word of God is a living, breathing entity. It's not words on paper. That's right. It's what's not written here in words. I mean, people always say, ah, oh, the word of God is open to translation. Uh, maybe so. But the spirituality behind the word of God is. That's right. I love it how people try to take, and, and, and trust me, there are things written on the page that are meant to be taken literal. And what words and what portion of scripture do you think, if I was to point out or if I was to draw a line and say, okay, these written words on the paper are for being taken literal. Anybody have a guess? Kind of salvation. The words are written that have the spiritual application written already there. You must be born again of the spirit and the water. The water and the spirit. There's no translation, alliteration, no hidden message there. That's right. Because he's talking, he's talking of himself. Well, Peter God does not repent to be baptized every one of you name for the name of Jesus for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's literal. Why? Because it's already got the spiritual application right there on the page. Right. Yeah. It's already there. So there are portions of the Word of God designed to be taken literal. Why? Because they're speaking of Himself. 
nothing to imply. Because it's right there. So God speaks to us Amen. through between the pages and between the covers of his holy word. The one thing that we apostolics don't read enough of, I'm going to rephrase it, that we apostolics don't study. We read it. We do the red charts. We read it through. Mm -hmm. But if you were actually studying it, there's no way you could do it in a year. Right. You could spend a lifetime on the Word of God and not study it from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Just can't do it. So we get so fixated on reading the Bible. But at some point, the Bible's got to speak to us. And that's where hearing the voice of God is disconnected within us. So then what does that mean? Then I just grab the Bible and just read the, oh, the words that are in red. Because those are really the word of God, the voice of God. I, my, I have red letter edition. Those are the words of Jesus. And, 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 and that, that's the word. You still could spend a lifetime studying all that stuff that he's written or read. But sometimes we got to understand something. God speaks through the Bible. That's right. Now, granted, there are times that I've known people that said that word. God's voice. And a lot of times, I'm like, well, what does it sound like? How do you know it was God? So, young man, I wanted to know. I wanted to be able to recognize the voice of God when he called. I wanted to know what does it sound like? Because my mother has a distinct sound. And I know what's on her mind just on how she says my name. I know these things. And there's a distinct, a distinct sound. So, so then in my youthful mind, I tried to imagine what would God Almighty sound like if he talked. It was verbal. It would be this deep, majestic, loud voice that just what would be a high pitch sound? What would it be? And it wasn't until I got older that God revealed to me. He says, I speak through the word of God. You've already got my voice. It's right there. What do you mean? It's right there. I, 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 I want to hear your voice. I, I respond better to the spoken word. He says, if you study my word, I will speak to you through it. Mm -hmm. And that's when God starts to reveal himself through the written word. And you got to sense so much about, I mean, we had a family Bible when I was a kid. It was on a coffee table. And I I loved pages <coughs> in that Bible. I loved it had some great pictures in it. Great artistry in it. Oh, just unbelievable. Just awesome. And and the, and the pictures of, of Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the fish. The Bible doesn't say whale. 
and the big fish. It just comes alive in those pictures. And I used to read them, look at that. But I was interested in the stories. And when I was a kid, and I, we, were, we were told to read the Bible to it. I got this idea, being lazy that I am. I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm lazy. And I'll be the second one to tell you I'm a procrastinator. Because everybody else who says I'm always late, or I'm late with stuff, will tell you first that I'm a procrastinator. But I realized that if I would just focus on the cool historical events that's written in the Bible, you pretty much get all the way through it. You just get rid of the gas and the gods. You get rid of all that minutia stuff that, you know, a lot of people skip anyways. And then you just focus on the stories. Just focus on the historical events. I love history. I love learning about history. Especially American history. I love it. I like to read how, how European history played into American history. I like to read about those because there's great characters in our history. Amen. I did a I did a, a Bible study. Not, not Bible study. I did a a a uh, it wasn't really a book report, it was more like a I'll just call it a book for lack of a better word. Essay, but it was verbal. I had to think of it. I do a presentation on a character that, and I, and I picked a character that nobody knew anything about, John Paul Jones. And even to this day, because I did that character, I, I still remember John Paul Jones. Oh, you guys, you guys know who John Paul Jones is? Mm -hmm. Probably not. He is the one who made famous the phrase, I have not yet begun to fight. Mm -hmm. That was John Paul Jones. I remember that. I got into it because I, I related to the character. I pictured myself on that ship. I pictured myself on, on him standing before his men when all hope is gone. And he said, we have not yet begun to fight. And I'm like, yeah. And so our history is loaded with people like that. And so I just figured, hey, you know what? If you read enough, read, if you read just the historical events of the, of the, of the, the things that you like, like the the liars, the, the um, um, Abraham, the um, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and, all, and, and Daniel, and you, read, you, you do pretty much full Bible cover. Um, no, there's some things that you're missing there, but you know, as a kid, this was my reasoning. Why it was all about reading the Bible? It wasn't about the Bible transforming me. Mm -hmm. So I was more interested in the read, read words just so I can get through it, rather than allowing the word to change me. And allowing my uh, my my chance to hear the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people say, I, I, we got this phrase, and uh, what thus saith the word of God? We use that Bible talk all the time. So so the Bible, so the teacher would give them a lecture and says, what thus saith the word of God about this? Well, then that would be our trying to figure out what, what, what's going on. And then I all of a sudden it dawned on me. And God's been speaking to me all along. I just wasn't listening. Every time I open the covers of the word of God, God speaks. Amen. God It's the voice 
just the intent of the spoken word behind the word that gets you my attention. Okay, God, what are you trying to say? Do we realize that the fiery furnace had really nothing to do with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace? Do you realize that that was an event in history that God used to burn that kingdom of Babylon to God? Because King Nebuchadnezzar says, We will serve the Lord of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. And they come out of that fiery furnace unscathed. They didn't even smell the smoke. It was that God used Shadrach, Meshach, Shack, and Abednego to turn a nation to Him. What's the spiritual obligation of that? desire is to turn people to him. That's God's desire. And if that means putting you through a fiery furnace, he's willing to do it. He just needs people right. that say, here am I, I'll go through it. Amen. We get a little warm. I'm come and we, we have to turn the fans on. It's too, too warm through bear. How quick would we crumble if we had the threat of a fiery furnace? And they said, I don't care, King. You can play the trumpet all you want. We're not going to allow it. And then they reasoned with it. To die would be gain. You know, if we died, well, how are we going to lose out in that? How does that make us losers? See? So we need, we need to understand that God speaks through the Word of God. Between those covers are God, is God's living, breathing Word. And if we just take it at face value, we miss the voice of God. So we need to work on our listening skills. Yes. What thus saith the word of the Lord? What thus saith God? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. I got the high sign. Dear Lord, I love you, Lord. I appreciate you. I think we'll stop doing that. We study your word. And, and to, to understand, help us to understand you through it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Go over this place, Lord. Help us not be just hearers of the Lord, be doers also, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Use his great glory. Amen. Don't forget, these are first nights at 6 o'clock service.